Welcome to my talk today about the technical deep dive into the exit backdoor. Uh, the title is carefully chosen because it's not a deep dive, but only a technical deep dive. So I will focus mostly on the technical parts of it. I'm not an analyst, so I will not try to do any attribution of the backdoor, who did it, why did they, whatever. Um, it's purely for technical uh, stuff. Because I think it's super interesting um, for defenders and offensive uh, like red teamers alike to see what they did, what could be repurposed, what could be defended against, etc. Um, if you like, I put a QR code on the title slide for the, the presentation slides, uh, if you trust me. Uh, but promised, it's just the slides. So I said I'm not an um, analyst, so what's my area of expertise? I'm a security engineer and red teamer at Google. Before that, I was a penetration tester and trainer for secure coding and web application security. Uh, personally, I'm interested in offensive tooling, uh, specifically work-related, um, and this research about the Spector was done in my personal uh, spare time, uh, and yeah, led me to some sleepless nights over Easter. Um, not because I had to, but because I wanted to. <laughs> okay, let's dive right in. Um, <clears throat> You already showed with your, or not showed if you showed of hands, that pretty much everyone heard about the XZ backdoor before. But still, uh, what's XZ? What's this talk about? Uh, XZ itself is actually a data compression format, uh, container format. So it's not the compression itself, it's the container. It's implemented by XZ Utils, which is an open source project. And the container format is based on LZMA, which is a compression algorithm. Also, known from uh, its use in uh, 7-zip, for example. The project was famously backdoored in 2024, so beginning of this year, and <coughs> the detection of the uh, backdoor was actually interesting because it was detected by a PostgreSQL engineer from Microsoft who tried to do some performance benchmarking of some PostgreSQL code. So they spun up a couple of VMs, um, and try to keep the noise level of other software as low as possible and notice some CPU spikes. <clears throat> and that's obviously not something you want to do to have if you're going to do performance benchmarking. So they looked into it. Turned out the performance, the CPU spikes were coming from OpenSSH servers running in the VM or like a one OpenSSH server. Um, for those who don't know, maybe because you're primarily focusing on Microsoft things, um, OpenSSH is a very popular and almost exclusively used uh, remote management tool for Linux and Unix systems. This allows you to remotely log into those servers or systems to then have um, a shell which you can interact with. And this engineer noticed hmm, these VMs are, as most of them are, if they're publicly available, are probed constantly by people on the internet. But this shouldn't, in fact, uh, affect OpenSSH too much. But suddenly, or curiously, the, the servers started to have huge CPU spikes every time someone tried to connect. So that's where all the uh, investigations of them started and where they then reported that they discovered a backdoor. <clears throat> As I said, the backdoor was an open source project called Except Utils. Also, the target was an open, is an open source project, OpenSSH, which gives us a unique uh, opportunity to look at the whole chain of it, not just what the final backdoor is doing. Uh, compared, for example, to the SolarWinds incidents, which is hap was happening in closed source software, um, here we have the opportunity to look into the full part of it. So therefore, let's start at the beginning and let's have a look on how the backdoor infected or how they actually infected the code. <clears throat> uh, Utils is based on, currently based on, an autoconf-based uh, build system. Autoconf is a build system in the Unix world which existed for a long time. It uses M4 scripts which are a micro language almost 50 years old by now. And the backdoor consists of multiple stages for just getting into 
their final position. <coughs> All started with this one commit here, which added five more uh, test files to the project. Two of them were actually part of the backdoor. Um, it has been noted that this project has more than 100 test files. So it's not like uh, something which is out of the ordinary. Um, these two files, you can see them here, uh, bad free corrupt and good large compressed, were described in the readme as the bad free corrupt consists of three streams in an XSet format. The first stream is a good one, the second one is a corrupted one, and the third stream is a good one again. The good large compressed test file is described as a compressed file where the uncompressed data is uh, kilobytes of single characters, like one kilobyte of A, then some kilobytes of random data, then one kilobyte of B, then random data again, C, etc. And that's actually what, what you could see if it uncompressed it. Then those were the files in the source code repository. But without anything else, they are pretty harmless at that point. What changed is the malware author at that point, at some point, so they were part of the uh, open source project itself, so they had the capability to commit stuff and release, uh, make new releases. Um, at some point, they made a new release, which contained this file, the m4 build to host m4 file. Um, this file is one of these m4 scripts typically used in autoconf systems. And what these M4 scripts do, they affect the generation of a so-called configure file, which is a shell script, which someone who wants to use a library or a binary um, executes. This will then look for all the dependencies and tell you, for example, if something is missing or figures out where the locations are. So let's have a look at this M4 file. Um, this is a patch uh, diff of the M4 file. Uh, I made, you don't have to read it here, I will go through it in uh, in steps, just to see, uh, give you an uh, impression on what the changes are, how, how many there are. Um, this is not a whole lot of, of changes. This file was also only included in the release tar file, which is expected, because if you have an autoconf-based system, if you make a release, the maintainer of the library or the binary will execute autoconf, it will generate, will copy over these files, these M4 files, and generate configure. Um, this is done so that the actual person who wants to use it only has to execute the configure if they want, but it can also regenerate the configure script uh, if needed. So this M4 script, the build to host one, is also not, uh, typically not a malicious one or anything which is unexpected. This is a file which is coming from the GNU lib library. Um, in, on most systems, you will get this if you install the get text um, package. And what autoconf does, if you run it, it will copy this file over into your uh, source repository so that you can then make a release out of it. The first thing the adversaries did was they changed the serial number of the script to a higher one from 3 to 30 to prevent future updates. So whenever someone would rerun autoconf, autoconf would say, see that, okay, the version of the file I already have is at 30, so I won't update the script. The next thing they did was they introduced some new variables. Um, here you have the am config make, the prefix, pill path map, and the config one. And then also they added a new config command to the configure script, which is automatically executed whenever you run configure. Let's have a look at those uh, variables. Um, we have these four, and I color coded them a little bit. If it's darkish blue, that's uh, just a string. If it's this purple color, it's a command which gets executed uh, kind of immediately if you run configure. So let's take a look at the second parameter first, the second variable first. We have this grab call. Um, grab is a command in Linux to search through files, to find specific patterns. And what this one does here, it looks through all files in the source repository or in the source folder to see if there's a file with a specific pattern. And actually there is one single file. 
Um, and it's one of those test files. So let's use this file name and put it into the next uh, variable and next line. So this line uh, was called prefix, and it takes the file name and sends it to a sed command, which is a stream editor, typically used for search and replace. Um, although it's called prefix, what it actually does, it, it takes the extension, like the suffix of the file name, which coincidentally, or not, uh, is the same name as the exit um, binary, which is the binary from the exit utils to compress and decompress files. So then let's merge these top, uh, top three variables in the last one, and we will end up like this. First, you have another SED call. Um, as said, SED files uh, commands are typically used for search and replace, but they're actually way more powerful. Um, what we see here, what it looks like, is that someone is doing something with new lines, but instead what it's doing, the R command you see, is actually stands for read, and it tries to read a file named backslash m. And this file does not exist, so it does nothing in this command, but it still outputs the content of the file it, it was given, like the test file there. So that's essentially a cut command, an obfuscated one. It then sends the content of this uh, test file through translate, the tr command, which is um, you give it a set of characters, and then two sets of characters, and it translates from one set to the other. So it's, in this case, it's kind of a substitution cipher, translating tabs to spaces, spaces to tabs, dashes to underscores, and underscores to dashes. And then finally, it decrypt, uh, decompresses uh, the, uh, the result and pipes it through shell. Let's have a look what we get out of it. So that's the first shell script, which I call stage one of the build infection. Um, you might remember this is from the bad three corrupt one. So it actually contains three streams. That's stream one, which is the good one. Then this is the now good one, but originally corrupted one. And then stream three, which was already good again in, uh, in, the, in the beginning. So let's have a look at this new stream we got. First, it decompresses another test file, the large compressed one. Then it takes the content of or the decompressed content and pipes it through a subshell. <coughs> and this subshell calls several head commands. A head command is a command in Linux or Unix systems which takes the first amount of specified bytes or lines and uh, skips the rest. Kind of. So what it does here is, for example, the first one you see with the 1024, it reads the first 1024 bytes and sends it to defnal, which is kind of a black hole. Then it least reads the next 20,048 bytes, so two kilobytes, and passes them on, and so on and so on. What the adversary leveraged here is that if you do this in a subshell, all of them share the same input and output streams. So the first one reads one kilobyte of the stream, the second one two kilobytes, and so on. So you don't have, you don't start over from the file, instead you're reading from one stream and produce another. Um, to visualize this a little bit, um, this, those are images I took from an uh, ex-colleague and they're from their blog post, where you can see the entropy graph of those, of this decompressed test file, and it, Top one is the one with these uh, A's and B's and C's, etc. in it. Those are these gray lines. And then when you remove all of them, which this command does, you end up with a high entropy result, which indicates either en uh, encryption or compression. So that's what it actually does next. It takes the last 30 kilobytes of the output, does another uh, substitution cipher, this time over the whole 256 bytes range, and then decompresses this again, and executes it uh, through a shell again. Which means we end up at the stage two shell script, which is a little bit bigger, uh, and has some features. It's re-entrant, it's extensible, it's quite conservative in what it's running in, and it dynamically affects the build um, environment. So let's start at the top. 
The script is designed to start uh, to be called multiple times. First, when in, when the, in the root folder the config script is executed, that's the first if statement. It checks for a file called config status, which gets created uh, by the config script. And then the second time, when it's executed from within the lib a subfolder of the project uh, via make. So here it's checking for those object files, which get generated by the make file. Then the another thing is that it's extensible in such that it has kind of a hook system in it. So you see the very first line and the last line in the screenshot, you have an eval command, which means interpret whatever is in this uh, uh, variable. Um, so this gives the adversary an opportunity to alter the execution or debug the execution during development, for example. And the second thing is the script does the same thing again it did for the um, config, uh, for the M4 uh, version, where it looks for specific files with a specific content, deciphers them, decompresses them, and executes them. So this gives the adversary the opportunity that in the future they don't have, if they want to update something, they don't have to change the test files they already committed. Instead, they can commit new files which will then affect, will be called by the, the original test files and can affect the result of it, which is way less suspicious than changing test files without any reason. Then, uh, as I said, the, it's running multiple times um, and will uh, dynamically change stuff and it's conservative. So during the configure run, it does a bunch of checks. Uh, first, it checks if ifunc support is there. I will come, what this is, we'll explain a little bit later. It will check if it's using the GNU compiler tool chain. It checks if it's running for a Debian package or an APM based package like in Fedora, for example. And also checks for the existence, existence of some files and their contents, um, which I left out in the screenshot here to not make it too big. What it then does, if this all went, is is done and all uh, as we expected. It will uh, enable early symbol resolving in the library. Uh, it will sort its elf sections, we'll, why this is important also later, and then it will call itself again for the second run. Um, and the second run is similar to before. It takes the corrupt one, deciphers it, decompresses it, and runs it through the shell. So in the second run, if we're doing the make file, uh, the, the make execution. It will take the good large compressed test file again, and will decrypt it with an RC4-like algorithm in AWK. AWK is also a script um, editor, a script uh, interpreter in Unix systems. Why uh, RC4-like? Because RC4. Uh, encryption works in the end by XORing uh, a random a pseudo random stream with the byte you want to encrypt or decrypt, uh, and they added it. Um, not really clear why. My interpretation is either they wanted to stay as uh, generic as possible because the XOR operation is only available in the GNU version of AWK and not the one in Unix, for example. Another explanation could be that a misunderstanding because some um, descriptions of cryptographic algorithms are using uh, addition instead of XOR because an addition in um, addition mod modular 2 is the same as an XOR. Um, so it could be a misunderstanding or could be on purpose to to be like a uh, generic, but we don't know. So what this then results to, they decom after decrypting the, the, the file and decompressing it again, you will get a 68 kilobyte uh, big object file, uh, which is like part of the compilation step. They will then patch two C files, CSC64 and CSC32, by ad adding a new function, this is our extension supported file uh, function, which will call uh, get CPU ID. Um, get CPU ID or CPU ID is an compiler instruction to identify what features a uh, CPU uh, supports. Uh, CPU instruction with 
Yeah. So you can use that to figure out like if the CPU supports additional features. Um, the actual original files also use that one, but their function name is underscore underscore get CPU ID instead of a single underscore. Also, this one has an additional parameter, the built-in frame address, which gives you a pointer to the stack frame um, of the of the uh, calling function. So why this important? Also in a second. Um, this then object file will then finally linked into the the actual one, the CLC64 fast one, which will then be compiled into the actual library. So at that point, the lib LZML SO binary uh, library is successfully infected. This was then pack, packed up by maintainers of Debian and Fedora. So we had at this point um, infected backdoor libraries in the distributions. So the question now is, okay, this library is backdoored. How does this relate to OpenSSH? Normally it wouldn't, because OpenSSH does not use libLZMA. But um, there's a feature in systemd which allows services to signal if they are fully booted up, so then accept connections, for example. Uh, the Debian and Fedora maintainers added custom patches to OpenSSH to include this feature, and they did this by linking to libSystemd, another library. This library links to libLZMA for different features unrelated to this um, notification feature. Um, as a small fact, after this incident, the OpenSSH maintainers added direct support for this notification system. A, um, because it's actually a pretty simple protocol. You connect to a socket and send ready as a string. That's it. You don't, don't need any library to do it, whatever. Um, so they just added it and do not have this again in the future. Okay, now we have successfully infected OpenSSH servers. Let's see what the runtime is doing, uh, the vector is doing at runtime. First, it does a lot of setup steps. I mentioned before it's looking for ifunc support. ifunc is a feature in the GNU dynamic linker. The dynamic linker is something which, um, if you start up a binary, it will look what your dependencies are, what load libraries, etc. loads them, looks what their dependencies are, and so on, and resolves symbols so that if, say, you want to use printf, it will check, okay, where's libc? I load libc, where's printf and libc, and then link them all together. Um, ifunc is a feature there which you can specify callbacks in your library. Um, so if something is looking for printf, for example, libc could register an ifunc uh, callback to say, okay, if someone's looking for this, this function call, please call this callback first and I will tell you what the result is. This is typically used for CPU optimizations. So the actual libLZMA uh, project does this for their CLC implementation. So if you have a CPU which has special vector instructions, it will use that. Otherwise it will fall back to a pure software based uh, algorithm. The backdoor leverages this fact to trigger its execution at load time. This has multiple advantages. First, it's less a lesser known technique than init functions, also known as constructors, which are functions which uh, get executed when a library loads. Second, it runs uh, before any main or init function is called. It's pretty much the earliest point in time you can get a code execution when a library is loaded. And uh, this is also important, actually, for their functionality. Um, as said before, they, they use the set, the get CPU ID call to um, then trigger the actual uh, main part of the, the backdoor. And they do this by, in their iPhone handler, they overriding the global offset table entry for CPU ID by their own function, and then reverted it back. Um, so what is the global op uh, offset table? The global offset table is a mechanism in ELF files, so the binary is used by Linux system and others, others to resolve uh, imported functions at runtime. So when you have code which calls printf, it will actually point 
to the uh, procedure linkage table, which is another code section which jumps to whatever is stored in this global offset table. And initially, it points back to the procedure linkage table again, which then will resolve your symbol and will then update the global offset table with the address of the actual function. So in the next time, you will jump directly to the function instead of doing the resolving. <clears throat> so this has been used in quite some exploitation techniques. So there's a uh, mitigation in, uh, typically, which is called railroad, uh, relocation read only. This enables early resolving, so it's not lazy loaded as here, but instead during load time, all the dependencies are resolved. And then it will mark the global offset table as read only, so you can't modify it anymore. This would defeat, for example, one of these steps and also later steps. And that's why the backdoor also have to run as part of ifunc, because at that point you're still in the symbol resolving stage and the stuff is not marked as read only, but is still read write enabled. <clears throat> so I mentioned before that there was this actual parameter which pointed to the, to the stack address. And the backdoor uses that to figure out who called their callback, which is typically the dynamic loader itself, called LDSO. So they now have a pointer inside the address space of the LDSO file in memory. And what they do now is they walk backwards in memory to find the start of this, this elf binary, this elf library. Um, they do this by page-wise scanning backwards for some magic, um, which is at, at any start, uh, the start of any elf file. Uh, in exploitation um, techniques, it's also called egg hunting to some degree. So what you naively would do is, okay, you scan backwards and then check, okay, is there an, uh, is at this address this magic? Like, is it start with 7f, elf, no, okay, next one, etc. The backdoor doesn't do this to hide the fact that they're looking for this magic. Instead, they have another obfuscation techniques. Um, they're using a so-called lookup tree. So they give, they take an address, look at the first byte of the address. Then they have, uh, like in the first layer, they look, okay, is it one of these characters? Let's assume it's a space. If it's the case, then they go to the next layer and see, okay, is this an F or an S? Okay, it's an F. Then it's an R, O, M, and space. And if they end up at the leaf, they return uh, a value, 0x810 uh, in this case. And then they compare this value to what they actually want to have. For example, on the right, you have this one for elf, which is 0x300. So what they do is, they scan the memory, do the search lookup, and then compare the, the results. If you have a uh, character which does not match to a node, it will just return zero. The benefit of this is, compared to, for example, hashing, which some other malware does, is that you don't have to know how many bytes you have to compare. You just walk the tree, and either you end up at a leaf node with a number, or you bail out and say zero. The downside is, uh, if someone figures out what you're doing, what people did, you can also walk the tree and reconstruct all the strings the binary is looking for, or the vector is looking for. Once it found the LDSO binary in memory, um, the next step it's doing, it's part looking for its own arguments and the environment used when starting SSH. So it's resolving a global variable called libc stack end and uses that to figure out where the stack of the program starts because there is, are the, the arguments and environment variables stored. It then uses that to verify that the program name is user SBN SSHD, not just SSHD and not something else. It verifies that it wasn't started in debug mode, so the dash D argument is missing. And it checks that not something, some specific environment variables were set which, for example, would influence the loader to spit out more debugging information, or um, display or lines, which would indicate that it's run by a human person instead of part of an, uh, a service. When this is all fine, it will look for our debug, another global variable which 
have a linked list to all libraries I currently loaded in memory. It will then walk this linked list to figure out where SSHD is in memory, where libc is in memory, where libsystemd is in memory, although I haven't found where they use that information, where libcrypt is in memory, which is part of OpenSSL, where itself is in memory, and again, where LDSO is in memory. All of them are then parsed for their relocations and symbols. Small detour again, what are relocations? Um, libraries and also modern uh, binaries, which for example have ASLR enabled, can be placed at any address, address in memory. But they still need a, a way to point to itself, like to addresses inside the binary. So for that, relocations are used, which will be updated by the dynamic uh, loader during startup to, to point to the actual addresses. These relocations typically describe the file offset, uh, something should need, should need to be up, uh, updated, and how it should be updated. For example, an offset to the base address, um, as an example. Then they used uh, another obfuscation technique. <coughs> so libLCMA, the legitimate one, allows you to, custom, to use custom allocators. So you don't have to use malloc, for example. You can have your own uh, there. The vector uses that to also use their own allocator, which will actually point to their symbol resolving function. So what they do here, the alloc pointer to, a, to the function uh, will point to the resolver function. Then the OPEC uh, field will point to the library they want to search through. And then the size will have a value of their search tree to compare to. And so they can resolve functions without directly calling this, these, uh, fun um, this function so making it harder for statically analyzing it. <clears throat> so the next thing it does, does more, um, the backdoor needs some access to some SSHD internal back, uh, structures. Uh, for example, for logging an IPC channel. Um, to get to them, they're using some search algorithm which is similar to what professional disassemblers do. First, they get a location of strings they know which are included in these functions they want to find and looks for them in the read-only data segment. Then they go for the relocations they passed earlier to figure out what relocation uh, would lead to point to the string to then find the function which is pointing to the string. Then they implemented their own AMD64 disassembler to parse the function to figure out where the function starts and where it ends and to what other parts of memory it's pointing to. And that's then how they find the data structures they want to use. So I just mentioned IPC channel because that's uh, also an interesting bit. OpenSSH uh, uses something to reduce the risk of being uh, compromised in such that you have the main SSH service is the top red one, which is running as root and it's listed on two, uh, port 22. Uh, so it accepts your connections. Whenever a connection comes in, it will sp spin up a new binary, um, a new instance called a monitor, um, which will handle all the authentication part. This binary or this instance will spin up a new binary, which will handle all the network parsing part, the green one to the right. And that is where you typically interact with um, when, when you connect it to something. And those two, the monitor and the the network parsing one communicate over an IPC channel. So when you send an SSH packet, the, the green one on the right will pass all the stuff. For example, will pass your password out of the, the login um, packet or the public key, pass it to the monitor, then the monitor will say yes or no. And depending on that, um, the, the network parsing one will give it the session key and then the monitor will create a new instance again, which will then run as the user you're log logging in as um, with the session key previously established. <clears throat> so this is, we're still in the setup phase. Um, what the backdoor then does is they try to hook multiple um, functions. Um, most of them are in the OpenSSL library libcrypt. Uh, the first one is RSA public decrypt, which is used to decrypt a string based together with an RSA public key. Um, then one which sets an RSA public key to a private key, and one which parses parts of an uh, RSA public key. 
So as we were really early in the execution, the, the uh, global offset table wasn't fully set up yet. So you, the backdoor doesn't necessarily know where the actual implementations of these functions are. So what they're doing is they register and so-called RTLD audit hook, which is something you can do to get notified if a symbol will be resolved. And then you can influence on uh, to what it's resolved to, not just for your own library, but for everything in the current namespace. Uh, this typically needs to be enabled via environment variables, but the backdoor directly modifies the hook in memory, so this uh, environment variable does not need to be set. And with that, they then figure out like where the ASA public key crypt uh, functions are, etc., and um, override them. So, one of the last obfuscation techniques for the setup stage is they added self-checks and uh, key reconstruction on the same thing. Many functions of the, the backdoor start with a function call. This function call will verify that the function which called it starts with a proper uh, function prologue. So this could either be uh, some pushes or a specific CPU instruction. By doing that, it prevents you from using software breakpoints because they would modify the instruction in memory. Also prevents you from hooking it, so adding chumps, for example. Then what it then does, it will count certain instructions in the, the calling function and uses that to reconstruct an elliptic curve key, which they will use later for communication. This has multiple uh, advantages first. Again, it prevents you from software breakpoints because you might modify the instructions and then the key would be incorrect. And B, um, the key does not lay around in the, the actual binary but will be constructed at memory at runtime. So now everything is set up. Let's take a look what a backdoor actually can do or does. RC public decrypt is used by SSHD to decrypt challenges or certificate signatures. So if you authenticate with a public key, uh, with a private key, um, the server will send you a challenge, you have to encrypt it, um, and then send it back, and then it verifies that you correctly encrypted it. Or if you send the SSH, uh, SSH certificate, it will verify the certificate by decrypting the signature. The backdoor leverage that to, in such that it's the commands for the backdoor are hidden in the public component of the RSA key. So if a client connects and sends an RSA key, uh, public key to the server to authenticate, the commands are hidden in the public part of the key. Um, this is by genius in my opinion for multiple reasons because A, um, those parts are typically kind of opaque. Um, they do follow some constraints but no one really understands them or looks at them. B, as I showed earlier in this architecture graph, you're communicating with the network parsing binary, um, but that will then pass on your key to the monitor, which is running as root. Uh, but it won't give, won't send on the network packets there. It will only send it the parse data from it, which includes as a public key. So by that, it, they're bridging all the IPC channels without having to, to have like any bugs or any other um, issues in the open SSH, uh, backdoors in the open SSH binary. The payload itself um, is uh, encrypted with a ChaCha20 uh, algorithm. The key that for this is derived from the elliptic curve key we had before. Then the decrypted payload will have a signature and the command payload. And the signature consists of the nonce, which is the command IDs uh, of the original package, the server public key, and the command payload, or at least parts of it. This means that if you would be able to record uh, an, an attempt to log in into one server, you can't use it on a different server because the server public key would be different. So for each command to a backdoor, uh, backdoor SSH, you have different signatures. And the signature is verified by this elliptic curve key, the ED448. So if you don't have the private key for it, you can't communicate to the SSH server. What commands does it support? Um, command ID1 hooks another monitoring function in the monitor, which checks if the password was correct. 
So they can use that to then log in with any password. Command two directly runs system. So it takes the command from the payload and runs it uh, on the on the system, um, typically with root privileges if it's run from the monitor. Uh, then the another command ID uh, is a little bit more elaborate. They first hook the key allowed function, which will verify if the key that someone was sending is allowed to log in. Then in these functions, they check for more commands. One is again uh, something for to check if the password was correct to override it. One hooks another function to verify if the key was correct to override it so that you can log in. And then again, something to execute system if they want. Um, then as a last obfuscation technique, the binary, the backdoor does at runtime is um, they prevent that log entries will be sent to syslog when the backdoor uh, code is hit. So you won't see any logins when the when this path uh, gets executed. But what they will do is they will also forge log entries. So they will create an arbitrary log entry which looks like there was an authentic uh, connection, but the connection was closed pre-authenticated, uh, pre-auth, so before it was authenticated. So they would log in with a fully functional session, but the log would show someone connected but disconnected before uh, they could authenticate. My conclusion in this, I said I'm not an analyst, so um, that's more my personal take. Um, the author of this backdoor had a lot of deep knowledge about Linux ecosystem and tooling, um, so how the configure, how the conf build system works, the internals about OpenSSH, uh, internals about the dynamic loaders, uh, etc. They invested a lot of time in trying to avoid detection and hinder analysis through like the obfuscation techniques, etc. Um, but as usual, if the more you uh, obfuscate, the more computational time you need to traverse it. And that's in the end, together with the OpenSSH architecture, uh, which got them detected because the protection ar architecture of OpenSSH based on the fact that they will spawn new processes every time um, a new connection comes in and every time they want to, to start passing network stream. And so all the setup steps we said before had to be re-executed every time. And this adds up. Um, this probably still hard to detect if you only have network delays, so you will have some noticeable delays, but it probably goes um, underneath like the usual noise of, of network. Um, and you also can't scan it remotely because of the use of the EC signatures and the host key signing. So you can't take an existing packet, for example, and try to send it. It will just deny it, uh, like bail out and continue with the normal OpenSSH flow. Also, if the signature is wrong, it will bail out. So the only indication you have that the backdoor is there if you don't have access to the system itself is uh, some time delays. Um, it's one of the more sophisticated Linux malwares I have personally have encountered. And in my opinion, they got unlucky by overdoing the obfuscation techniques um, and then someone doing performance testing. Um, otherwise, this probably would have gone undetected for quite a while. Um, some references for you if you want to, to learn more. There's an actual community project about reverse engineering the malware. Um, I used this as part of presentation, uh, preparing the presentation to validate some of my analysis. Um, there's a great write-up about the timeline um, of the of what happened. So I have not talked at all on when the old thing started and all the steps in between. Um, so go there if you want to learn more. And then uh, a GitHub repository of mine, which is just uh, created, which contains uh, for now my Gitra project file. Um, if you want to to see the backdoor uh, on your own. And um, here also the file, the hash of the files are analyzed if you want to do um, your own research. And with that, I'm at the end and uh, hope you could follow a bit. I'm sorry it's like last day and end of day as well, um, but feel free to have, to ask any questions if you have them.